It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. Comics.aadl.org. This is the show where we talk about making comics, writing comics, drawing comics, philosophizing about how to do all those things in the lifestyle of a cartoonist and all the stuff that surrounds this medium that drives us all mad. My name is Jersey Drozd, cartoonist and teaching artist. With me today, we've got some, man, exciting roundtable today because uh, we've got two keen minds returning to the show in one keen mind joining us for the first time i'll start with the returning guests uh we got dean tripp back on the show hey dean what's up jersey uh dean tripp author of the amazing and powerful and moving comic something terrible um, which you can get at uh is what, what's the address it's just dean tripp.com is where you can get it just but... go to dean tripp.com there's yeah. a link um, also host of, or well, your future self is the co-host of The Last Cast. That's podcast. right. I, I think Ghost Dean is pretty entertaining. It's <laughs> broadcast back from the end of the earth. Uh, he's funny. And we're going to talk a lot about these projects in, in the discussion in, uh, coming up, but mostly in relating to Batman, because one of the things that if somebody is new to the show or new to you, they should know that everything that you do comes from Batman. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> I think it's funny because when you uh, before I had worked on something terrible, which obviously obviously tells the story of my life with Batman, and it's kind of like that footprints poem on the beach when there was one grapple line Batman was carrying me. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> before that, I, I would tell people, you know, like yeah, I basically based my life around Batman, and they'd be like, "That's cute," you know what I mean? <laughs> and then now, it's nice because. Uh, Having your your life story uh, out there and and well received, it, it's one of those things where it's like I don't have to uh, justify it anymore. It's just like no no no, Batman's a big deal, and uh, I'm proof that you can take it seriously and it can matter and it can you be something that fuels you to help people. And uh, it's not the only superhero I like, but Batman is my favorite. Sure, sure, yeah, uh, and and we can hear a two-hour discussion, a very real discussion on this book and your experience in making the book and what went into the book uh, on uh, Kevin Smith's podcast. Right? Yeah, Fat Man on Batman. Fat Man on Batman, which uh, people can do just do a search for it. Uh, the Smodcast, Kevin Smith, it should be very easy to find. We will link to it in the show notes. Um, but you do a lot of stuff, uh, and uh, the something terrible really, really just was. It, it got a lot of deserved attention. So congratulations on all the the accolades on it. Uh, Thanks, man. It, it deserves it, it. It's really weird for the thing you are most worried people would find out to now be the thing that is what you're most known for. But and again, we were talking off mic. I mean, that's you. You just did what Batman did, right? And you you demonstrated what real courage is and what the payoff for being courageous is. But we'll go into that more. I got to introduce the other guests. Uh, we've got returning to the show, Cole Glass, one of the keenest hey. storytelling minds I've encountered in recent years. Uh, uh, film, thanks, man. Filmmaker, uh, uh, creator of Der Ostwind, Orc Wars. Um, what was the one that you just watched, Rachel? The Prometheans. Yeah, did you like it? Oh my goodness, it was awesome. Yeah. Oh, Way to go. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and eventidecreative.com is where you can find his stuff. Now, Cole, you are responsible for this roundtable today because you emailed me and said, hey, I'd love to be back on the show. Uh, I had a lot of fun talking with you. And if you ever want to talk about Batman, I can really talk about Batman. And then uh, I was like, sure, you know, that sounds like fun. You know, I just had an episode where I just spent like an hour talking about He-Man. Why not? Uh, and then... I, I think it was you or I don't remember which one of us said, like, well, we kind of got to get Dean in on this because. <laughs> right. You wanted to have a discussion about Batman, so you should get somebody who will not stop talking so you can do that. Well, I got to say, Dean, this is the funny thing is, like, I had a moment of hesitation before emailing you because I was like, you know, Dean probably gets asked this a lot. He probably is going to be. I don't want to be the guy who is like, oh, Mr. Tripp, could you please talk about Batman? And then you go, oh, come on. Yeah, kid. that was, I, I really thought it was appropriate, though. I appreciated that you said Mr. Tripp. And, uh, <laughs> Mr. Tripp. That's correct. Uh, and I used that voice in the email, which is amazing. It's, it's, I know. It's, I could, well, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> but Mr. The, Tripp, <laughs> please you tell me more about the Batmans. And it, you, know, like you, it, you have to fit in the breathe like, oh, Mr. Tripp. But, um, but then I thought about it, and I was like, if anybody ever comes up and asks me, like, what's so great about He-Man? Oh my gosh! It doesn't matter. It could be it could be the Pope. It could be Satan. It could be whoever. I'll be like, oh, let me tell you. Uh, so I thought, well, maybe he won't mind. So I'm glad that you made the time, and I'm I'm so grateful, Cole, that you proposed this topic because um, 
yeah, yeah, I think it's going to be fun. So, also in studio, first time on the show, another cartoonist with a keen mind, Rachel Polk. Hi. Of rachelpolk.com. Wee. And you are, uh, your day job is you're my production assistant. I am. Which means you do what? You, uh, you get me coffee. I get you coffee. No, you don't. <laughs> no. I bring you coffee, actually. <laughs> That's very true. Um, <laughs> Large quantities of coffee. Um, but, so what do you do? You do uh, flatting? Um, uh, flatting, coloring, lettering. Uh, I'm coloring and letter and uh, flattering for you right you're now. You're flattering too, yes. Flattering. <laughs> um, but yes, you are working right now on Captain Seriously and the Supermaster Sentinels, yes. a comic that we, that I do every year. You're, you're coloring three issues coming out this yeah. year. Um, and then also you are doing production work on The Warren Report, a graphic yes. investigation of the JFK assassination, which comes out this September. Yes. And then, um, well, I, I, I think you're under NDA on the other ones. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so can't talk about the other ones, but you're doing other flatting and other lettering, professional yes. lettering. So, um, and you are also uh, a comic book fan. As a matter of fact, like when I first met you, that would have been six years ago. Yeah. You yeah. Were, <laughs> you were 14. And I thought, well, she's a girl. She's 14. She's probably into manga. Nope. X-Men. <laughs> Uh, X Men, Batman, and uh, you know you had like the superhero sneakers and everything. I was like, wow, yeah. that's... I actually wore them today. <laughs> I'm wearing my Batman shoes <laughs> to put you in the spirit. <laughs> yep. All right, so everybody's introduced. So now I get to punch out of my job and say, uh, Cole, why did you propose this topic? What's so great about Batman? And then I'm gonna let all of you guys fight like jackals over who gets to talk next. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> What's so um, great about Batman? Uh, you know what? I I I have this theory that if Batman isn't your favorite superhero, then you kind of hate humans. Like you are not. And it's I mean I jokingly say this, but for me, like Batman is you know like anytime somebody's like oh well like I like you know I like somebody else and and again I like a lot of superheroes. Um, you know, like, I think Spider-Man's probably my next favorite because he's, I like the complexity of him. But um, for me, it's like, you gotta, you gotta love Bats just because he's basically the pinnacle of what we could be. You know what I'm saying? And, and anytime there's a, a superpower introduced, it kind of takes us a step away from that. And so I think that that's kind of what his thing, and, and it's funny because, like, as a kid, um, I loved Batman and Robin. Now, the the funny thing was that, like, for some reason, I was I was more into Robin. Like, when me and my sister would play Batman and Robin, she would be Batman and I'd be Robin. And um, that kind of changed around. The you were the brother days. wonder. <laughs> what you say? You were the brother wonder. I was the brother wonder, and and it was. I mean, it's a weird thing to think back on now, but I think that Robin was doing exactly what he was supposed to be doing for me. Robin's but, awesome, man. Um, in the end, I think that I think that like it's amazing that like Batman can apply, can appeal to kids still. Like it seems like as a kid you'd be like, no, I want to be the Hulk. I want to be stronger than I am, or I want to be like. But instead, it's like, no, I want to be Batman. I want to put a cape on. I want to run around, and you know. And I think that there's something so universal. And in, in my opinion, it's he's probably the most universal. Superhero. Now, I know a lot of people will say no, and I know there's a lot of Superman fans that think, no, he's great, you know. But in my book, I say a love of Batman is the love of humanity and the potential of humanity. I like that. It's a hopeful thought because right. with Superman, uh, again, one of my top guys, but Batman is the number one, and part of it is that there's – it's – it's a fictional story, and it's funny that he's the second because he follows, you know, the most superpowered superhero, and the immediate follow it is his match, who just made himself that way. Um, mm. But yeah, I've been all over the world, and Batman's everywhere. Uh, there's not a corner of this earth that hasn't been touched by the story of the Dark Knight, and it is. Uh, I think you're right. It's due in large part to the fact that he's us. It's, it's you can put on. A cape. You can train yourself. There's there's a skills that you need to learn. You just go train. It's a it's a pretty hopeful story that you can recover from uh, the kind of trauma that he experienced, and rebuild yourself into the person that you want to be. Especially if you're going to dedicate your life to helping others. Batman's mine because I have a similar 
kind of life story with childhood trauma and then uh, the story of Batman helped me realize that I could plan. I could build myself. You, mm-hmm. You're in charge of who you are. You are who you choose to be, the story of every superhero story. Yeah, I remember, I think it was on the last time you were on the show, Dean, you said something that really just like hit me right between the eyes. You said like when you're a kid and something bad happens to you, the day before you went to school, everything was fine. All the other kids were happy and you're happy. And then you go to school the next day and everybody's happy, but you know something's not right. And you, you know the truth. It. Yeah, and you're alone and you're really, really scared. Now, I haven't gone through anything what you went through, which people read about in something terrible, which they should go by today. But, you know, there were things that happened, like to all of us as children, that where the next day we realize things aren't right and I feel utterly alone about this. And I never really made that connection, Cole, of this idea of the one different part of Batman's story that he teaches you is that you don't have to pretend to have powers. You don't have to fantasize about being powerful in order to fix it. Look, kid, I went through a really, really terrible thing and I fixed it to the best that I could, right? Um, yeah. I don't, I don't know if... It, it, you, and it doesn't have to be that. You know, the thing is, Batman... Like, if you think of Batman theory, right? This... Because Batman's this character that's still being built. He's constantly improving. We're 75 years in. Uh, so much good is right there in the first origin story by Bill Finger. But it, it does keep getting better. Like the characters and the family and the dislike of guns. Like all this stuff that's come in, uh, some of that very quickly. But it, it's it's grown and changed over time. Batman's uh, a spectrum, you know, like... There's people, I went through a phase, I think a lot of teenagers do, where it's like, I don't like the Adam West Batman, man. It's silly. Yeah. Why do they do like silly Batman? Well, because it is silly. The dude dresses up like a bat. You can do <laughs> silly stories about Batman. And also, that Batman's pretty dang heroic. You know, it is, I'm working with the police and fighting crime. Come along, Robin. You know, like, there's nothing yeah. wrong with that Batman. It's not the full picture of Batman, but any Batman story or, or portrayal is just a glimpse at the kind of like, the Batman theory that we're all working on. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's it's a spectrum. He can be the child who rebuilt himself. He can be just a, a fun adventure hero. It it's doesn't have to be any one thing. I think that's part of his appeal. It's a dude decides to be a superhero, end of that. Do you know what I mean? Like it's it's the decision that he makes that it's all about, and it doesn't matter what form you're you're reading Batman in. I, I particularly don't care for the crazy Batman stories, right. which is what led me to work on something terrible in the first place. Well, wait, 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 explain crazy Batman stories. A lot of people act like he's got PTSD or something, like he's driven by revenge mm. and no one gets in his way, and he's really dumb and angry. And uh, <laughs> yeah. he's the D- Dark Knight detective, you know what I mean? Like, in my mind, he's pretty together sharp dude who's built himself and built his family you know like he's raised other people to know that they can help others and use all of their abilities to help everyone they can and i think he'd be crazy if he wasn't batman yeah i i'm the same way the more the more a batman story gets away from him being a detective the less i like it like i love the i love this i love this idea that batman is the world's greatest detective you know what i'm saying and everyone's always like, well, what about Sherlock Holmes? Right. And I love... He passed I love the torch. What do you say? He passed the torch. He passed the torch. Yeah, he passed the torch. And I love, I love this, the, the comics where he meets Sherlock Holmes mm-hmm. and he has like absolute admiration for Sherlock Holmes. You know what I'm saying? Like he's like, he's like it is. It's, it's like the, it's, he passed the, tor- the torch. But mm-hmm. when, the, when he becomes a, a, just a fighter, a, like a, you know, just a kind of a brute who's like... I feel like that's a big misconception of Batman. People are like, oh, this is a guy who's trained himself how to fight. It's like, no, no. He knows how to fight, yes. But that's not all he is. He's not a guy who can fight with gadgets. Like, that's that's a Batman. Yeah, and I, I think it's okay for uh, Batman's portrayal to criminals to be really scary and violent. I think that's... Because, he's you know, he's, he's dressing up in costume to instill fear in criminals, you know. Mm. But... What, what the real Batman is the guy talking to Alfred and Dick and Tim in the cave, you know, and, and Barbara. It's not the mask. It's not – it's the third voice, you know. Right. Batman talks like this and Bruce Wayne talks like this. And then there's the guy in the cave. 
who's right. who he really is. You mean Kevin Conroy? Yeah, it's Kevin Conroy. <laughs> yeah, that That's yeah. who it really is. Uh, you know how badly I want him to read Batman's lines of dialogue from Something Terrible so that I can just listen to it every day? I, I assume you said this in every other interview that you've done on the book so that he'll hear it, right? No, I, I probably have mentioned it. <laughs> it's the first time I've said it that, that way, I think. That would have been an awesome stretch goal for your, for your Kickstarter. Right. Actually, yes. <laughs> we'll well, get we break Ke this, I'm going to get Kevin Conroy to record the whole thing. Oh, my gosh. Still could happen. You never know. That's true. Well, here's the thing. It's, it's, it's 30 minutes of the guy's time. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's four panels, man. It's like five minutes of his time. You can do it on the phone. Three or four sentences. Dear Kevin Conroy, please call me. My number is flashing at the bottom of the screen. I just want you to tell me I've done good. You know. Uh, what about what about the portrayal that some uh, creators take with him, where they kind of play up the paranoid aspect, like he's watching all the other heroes because one of them is gonna flip and they're gonna get him, or he's so, he's gonna have to protect us all from the heroes, right? Yeah. Uh, they even went a little tiny bit in that direction in Justice League um, Unlimited, a tiny tiny bit, and Green Arrow did it more than Batman, but. Um, yeah. How do you guys feel I about think that? It's bad for him to have an idea in mind or a contingency plan, but if you go too far down that road, then he's Lex Luthor. Mm -hmm. You know, it's I, I I get like Batman stories where like early on in meeting Superman and Wonder Woman and all those guys, he's pretty mistrustful. Like this guy's an alien. I don't know. But after you've been fighting alongside a dude for a long time, he's your buddy. He's your ally. Superman and Batman relate because they are really similar and really different, and their skill sets uh, have some overlap, and their fashion sense is just identical. But they, they, do, they, I think they've found a friend, someone that can understand this separation that they both feel. You know, they're different guys, very, very different guys, but they both have this similar thing. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think, I think. Justice League Unden Unlimited did it amazing. Like I loved. I think I think Justice League Unlimited is some of the best super superhero writing out there, uh, especially the first season. Second season was great too, though. Um, but yeah, I think I mean it's it's it makes a lot of sense, you know, especially when you have a lot of like villains out there who can do mind control and stuff like that. It's like yeah, I'm not. It's not that I distrust Superman, but you know, what if? Poison Ivy gets her claws into him, or you know, and and I gotta have, I gotta figure out something how to be, stop him. And so I think, you know, once the, you've the told preparation the is what's important, not the paranoia. Yeah, like I liked the uh, the Jeff Loeb thing where he keeps the ring Superman gave him in his belt buckle, which is lead lines. Mm -hmm. That was a pretty good conclusion. Like to me, that should be the end of it. Like we we don't have to keep doing. Everyone's trying to reclaim the glory of Batman versus Superman and the Dark Knight Returns, and nothing will ever touch it. Nothing can ever come close to those guys. And one of the reasons why that fight works is because they're such good friends. You know, uh, like we were talking about animated movies before we started recording, but like uh, the Batman Superman World's Finest movie does it really well too, where it's uh, Batman's distrustful, but he's also kind of amused by this guy. Superman's like annoyed at this vigilante, and he's like, Dude, do you not realize what you do also is <laughs> vigilantism? Like you're just you can fly, sure, but you're still just punching people. But right. uh, there's kind of a mutual respect that builds, and by the end of it, it's it's kind of like, all right, we're bros. It's cool. And the the ring in the belt buckle thing was a pretty clever little thing. It's like, yeah, and it's good because Superman trusted him. That's again right. just constantly pointing back to their friendship. Uh, a lot of people don't like Superman, and I'm a, a pretty big Superman fan, but the way in for me was that Batman likes him. Right. And uh, Superman trusting Batman, uh, a normal dude who he's worked alongside with uh, Lex Luthor's kryptonite ring is a pretty big trust. Hey, I, this is a thing that will only kill me. I want you to have it, <laughs> you know. Right. But but going too far with paranoid stuff gets you to Lex Luthor. Lex Luthor is another person who represents humanity, but he represents our fear. Batman's not afraid. He took his fear and turned it into something that is useful, and he's prepared. Being prepared is his superpower. Um, when you're prepared, you're not afraid. Agreed. It seems to me that where you guys are both kind of steering with this, what I'm hearing anyway, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that 
you have a a very positive spin on Batman's intention and act in the way he executes his goals, right? Um, even in his interpersonal relationships are all positive. It's based on trust and hope and fearlessness. And uh, uh, I wonder if this is why Dean, as we were talking about before the show started, and when we when you were last on the show, we kind of talked about this too. Is like this idea that you your work tends to suggest that superheroes work exceedingly well for children so let's make it so that it's accessible to children because when i think about like the the the, the teenage years that like many of us go through where we're like oh, this is my new superhero what what's he like well he's kind of like wolverine meets cyclops but he kills you know yeah. and, like that's like the thing you add and you're like ah i'm a i'm a genius you know <laughs> ellen moore is gonna come over I my house I used to run a comic shop, and this this kid came in to me, and he's like, I've got this completely original character. He's half Iceman, half Gambit, half Wolverine. <laughs> completely original. <laughs> Can't wait to see, you know, murder, explosion, cold front. You know? <laughs> like, but, but, like, I wonder if we can round back on this other idea about, like, you know, I see little kids, one of the very first Halloween costumes I ever had, and I don't consider myself, like, a huge Batman fan. I love I love Batman, but I'm not, like, you know, uh, waving the we'll flag. We'll get you. Yeah. <laughs> but one of my first Halloweens, who was I? I was Batman, you know, and this was, like, in 1979. Yeah. So, like, the, the Adam West show was over at that point. It was still in syndication, but there wasn't, outside of Super Friends, there wasn't a whole lot of, like, Batman stuff going on at the time. But, yeah, there I was going, like, I want to be Batman. Um, so I wonder if we could speak There's to that. something about it. Well, as a kid, you, you feel like you don't have any power or control, sure. and it's true. Like you're, you're so limited and told how small and uh, unuseful you are. Everyone's trying to tell you what to do, not explaining why they're having you do things, even when they're perfectly normal, like rules at school. There's reasons for most of them, but because I said so and because that's the way it is and this is the best time of your life and all this other nonsense people tell kids yeah. when really – they're the most oppressed they'll ever be, and they have the least understanding of why it's happening. And Batman's a character who had really horrible things happen to him when he was a kid. And even, you know, the other thing is kids don't know that. I didn't know Batman's origin until I was like 10 or 11, and uh, I liked Batman when I was younger than that. Yeah. Uh, but it's he's a very capable dude. Who needs superpowers? You know what I mean? He's really smart. His... Being clever is his power. Being clever and figuring things out and uh, helping people. With Superman, with superheroes, right? Like every superhero and supervillain origin is pretty identical. It's something weird happens and then they find out that I've got this magic ring or I've got superpowers or um, whatever it is. And then it comes down to your choice of like, I'll use this to help myself or oh, I could really use this to help people. And it comes down to your choice. Batman doesn't have the inciting incident. You know, he doesn't have the, oh, and now I can fly. He just decides to help people. There's no, I need to choose what to do with all this power. It's, I need power because I'm going to help people. And he goes and gets it. It's like reverse. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why is he the only one? <laughs> He's not, you know, and, and there's other characters on that level. Most of them in the DC universe or his friends and, and family, people that benefited by having a Batman. You know, Dick Grayson should be twice as capable as Batman because he had Batman to raise him. That's why he's more well-adjusted and in a better mood all the time because he's got to have fun kicking in the heads of criminals since he was 10. <laughs> but <laughs> swinging around rooftops, wearing bright colored spandex, it's fun, super fun. Yeah. Um, Does this imply he, that you've tried it? <laughs> You got to be real careful about secret identities. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, one thing I think is, is very interesting is that like Batman works for me as an adult totally different than when I was a kid. How so? Um, I think that I think that it kind of it kind of gets into you know this idea. Like I love the idea that he's he's created himself you know what i'm saying like like as an adult we have to create ourselves it's like that george bernard shaw quote that's like life isn't about finding yourself it's about creating yourself so we we, we try to create ourselves and so 
to see Batman create himself to such a degree that he, it becomes a power fantasy. What the work he's done has become a power fantasy. I don't think I grasped that as a kid. As, as a kid, it was the cape. It was the mask. It was the pow, biff. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, whereas now it's like, I mean, I think, it, I, I remember thinking, it was, it was around in high school where I was just like, I mean, just a little background. I, you know, I was a very creative kid and in the public school system, I, you know, I was being destroyed, right? Like I was getting bad <laughs> grades. My parents were like, you can do better. You can do, you know, like you're smarter. And I'm like, no, I'm not smarter. And then when I was a kid, I was like, or in high school, I was like, I want to be smarter. And it was, and it was a lot from Batman. Like I was reading Batman and I was like, I want to be smart like Batman. Okay. Make yourself smart like Brat- Batman. All right. So I started, I'm like, okay, first off, I don't read that much. I need to start reading more. So I started reading more. You know what I'm saying? Like these things come straight from my, from my understanding of what Batman, but it was a, it was a more mature thing. Like when I was, a, when I was 10, I wasn't saying I need to be smart. I need to read more. Mm-hmm. This was something later when I was like, I started getting my head around Batman as more of an adult thinking. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, so, so that's like why, you know, I, mean, I think it's in many ways, that's why I feel like I have this huge debt to Batman is because I feel great. I, I mean, there's, I still have this, I, this belief that, you know, I can, I can go and learn whatever I need to go learn and become an expert at it. So, and this is a, this is my Batman thinking, you know, is, 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 I, I'm just curious like, if I could, if I could sort of try to wrap it up in, in not wrap it up as in close it out, but like sort of like summarize what you're just saying here is, is this part of what makes the character so enduring? Cause uh, like Dean said, it's the 75th anniversary this year is that, He's constructed in some kind of genius way where you can appreciate him in one way as a child, another way as a teenager, and another way as an adult coming out the other side and finally figuring out who, hopefully figuring out who you are, and then still use it for, you know, for entertainment and sustenance and so on. But Because uh, I remember very similarly in high school, I was in, I want to say, ninth grade when the Michael Keaton movie came out. And I remember that was the moment where the switch flipped and suddenly I was like, oh, Batman, the, the world's greatest detective. Like, I never thought of him that way until about ninth grade. Before that, he had cool car, cool weapons, and he, you know, always beat the bad guy, and that's good enough for me. Um, but, like, it was, it was, I remember being really clear, like, now it's cool because he's really, really smart. I don't remember saying those words, you know, and you shouldn't say those words if you're ninth grade and a boy, but... <laughs> But uh, but yeah, I remember that. So I wonder I wonder if that, that's 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 part of the key here, and that's the thing that's worth like looking at and dissecting is that they, well, however they did it, whatever Bill Finger did, he built him in a way that you can enjoy him your entire life for a variety of reasons, and not just for nostalgia. Well, and depending on who you are, you know, uh, if you're an athletic guy, Batman's an inspiration because he trained his body to physical perfection and is unstoppable. If you're a smart guy, it's uh, he's the smartest guy in the room. If if you're just an empathetic person, he's someone who is driven to his core to just help people. Mm-hmm. There's there's a pretty wide range of stuff you can be. That's probably why I find the crazy angry Batman uh, the most <laughs> distressing because that's uh, a side of people I don't want encouraged, I guess. Uh, I'd rather people be out to help others or get smart or get in shape even though I'm not doing that last one. <laughs> like, I dress up as Batman for Halloween, and that involves Spanx. <laughs> like, I was just on Fat Man on Batman, but when, and Halloween, I'm going to be Batman, not Fat Man. It's just going to push all this together. Yeah. I, and, I mean, kind of going off of that, like, be, seeing how he, ha, like, how he affects you at different points. I mean, I remember as, like, it's a Remember, I apologize. I thought I turned that off. Anyway, um, <laughs> I, you know, as a kid, as a teenager, um, I read Dark Knight Returns, and I was like, oh, he's old. <laughs> you know, really? Well, I, you know, like as a, t- as you know, I was like, I was like, fourteen. You know, and I'm like a fifty year old Batman. Holy cow! That's like, I mean, I there was I love that story. Mm-hmm. But I was kind of like turned off about this idea of an old Batman. 
And now I'm like rounded in like the corner on a 40 and I'm, and I read it. I'm just like, you know, this is beautiful. You know, like, <laughs> My back hurts too. <laughs> <laughs> I, ne- I never had the problem with, with dad Batman. I think I, I pretty much replaced a lot of my father stuff in my life with Batman. So I always like grown up superheroes. Now that I am more of a grown up, I definitely do. They keep reverting the characters back to being in their 20s. And it's like, yeah. why do I don't even care what people in their 20s think about anything. Why would I want that <laughs> person in charge of saving the planet? Like, right, right. It's like when the John Hamm discussion for Superman, which, by the way, I'm pretty sure I started like three years before it blew up. But uh, they were like, oh, he's too old to play Superman. No, please put a grown-up in charge of the planet, please. Like, I yeah. have no interest in... 20 year old or 30 year old like hasn't found himself doesn't know what to do wussy indecisive superman ugh. yeah okay okay I, I got a, i've got a question for all three of you that i'm hoping you can respond to from the gut um because one a parallel when i read dark knight returns um when i reread it in my late 20s i remember feeling like the batman superman dichotomy was very it almost felt ayn randian to me it felt like, whoa, Batman is like a Howard Rourke and Superman is Peter Keating, right? Peter Keating sold out. He's the failure. And though, though they once had a history and everything, Batman's got to take him down because he's the guy who stuck to his principles and everything. Um, and the reason I bring that up is not to show how clever I am because I read Ayn Rand and made a connection to a comic thing. It, 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 and by the way, yes, I was insufferable for a year after reading her books. That's the way everyone is. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and now I know the true the truth of her politics. But anyway, uh, but one of, there's a line in one of Ayn Rand's books where a villain is saying to I can't remember which book it was. So wh- whichever one of her cardboard cutout heroes was getting yelled at by the villain, and the villain said, uh, "The problem with your philosophy is there's no release, there's no relief." You have to constantly try to be good, and you never get off the hook. You never get a break. Uh, if if you if if I subscribe to your philosophy, I have to be paying attention all the time. Now, question: You guys just talked about you know Batman should be not the crazy guy, not the guy who is uh, you know post traumatic stress disorder, uh, really violent because that's not positive. All of his act actions should come from some sense of wanting to help or improve the situation. Oh, that's a drag. I mean, like, wh- wh- where am I going to go for relief then? Now, where am I going to go for? I mean, I don't want to g- go watch, you know, uh, you know, Father Kickbutt t- t- <laughs> preach to the world about how cool, <laughs> you know, how cool it is to be righteous. I would say that Batman might be a better person than you, Jersey. <laughs> 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 I know I'm going out on a limb here. You know, with fictional characters, a lot of times people want to write them as very human and very flawed. And um, in, in normal stories, that's great. I'm, I'm reading some Elmore Leonard, and it's, I love characters like that. I, I like Boyd Crowder on Justified so much because he's just this fascinating, silver-tongued, foolish person, right? Uh, Raylan's also the same way. Flawed, awesome, great character. Mm-hmm. Superheroes aren't heroes, and you can tell superhero stories where they're flawed. Watchmen is like this dissection, perfect dissection of why superheroes wouldn't work in the real world. It's probably right. They're not in the real world. Yeah. Batman's incorruptible and he's unstoppable. And in the real, like, it's like death. Like, in the real world, you, we can't defeat death. In comic books, it's no problem. Colossus sacrificed himself to save the rest of mutant kind from the legacy virus and he was cremated and thrown into a river and he's fine now. (laughs) He's aces. No worries. That was a clone body. He was captured by aliens. They found him. He's fine. Because it's comics. We can solve problems we can't in the real world with our imaginations. Any problem that you see, just your solution vision solves it as it is observed. (laughs) And Batman and Superman can be more than we can be. Captain America is way more than America could ever be. And without that to strive for, without that symbol or, or story that we can be better, they're, they're just other stories. Superhero is the most successful genre of the, the world's ever known, honestly, I think, uh, because we've told more stories about Batman and Superman than we have of any other fictional characters ever. They've crossed all media. They're these genre-defying giants. And... That's because we want them to be. We want them to be better than we are. 
We want to know that we could be better if we really tried. I want, I want to hear from the under 21-year-old on this. Uh, so you're at that age where... Remember I mentioned 20-year-olds not knowing anything? Yeah. Under 21, <laughs> smart, super smart. Yeah. Those guys uh, know what yeah. The 20s uh-huh. that really, like, late, mid, late 20s, mm, no. Uh, I, I, I've been coaching, I've been pr- uh, trying to prepare Rachel for that. I said the next couple of years is when you make a whole lot of horrible mistakes, but it'll all be good for you. <laughs> oh, boy! <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, but uh, and thanks for wrecking my premise, Dean. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, what what what's your reaction to this idea of superheroes must be aspirational because you love a lot of different kinds of heroes. As a matter of fact, we did another show, which we can link to in the show notes. Um, we did a little mm-hmm. short podcast, which people can find out at the Lean Into Art Patreon site, patreoncom slash Um and you said, you know, like one of your favorite X-Men characters is Phoenix. Why? Because she destroys everything <laughs> and she's really, really powerful. But then there's like all this really cool tension about how she can't control it and all this other stuff. Yeah. But um, so like I want your point of view is is the this aspirational notion of Batman. Uh, thumbs up, thumbs down, cool or lame? Well, the thing about Batman that I always loved was that, I mean, he doesn't have superpowers. So mm-hmm. he's not, he's human. He's not an otherworldly being um and so as humans ourselves hopefully um (laughs) we can all uh we can all identify with that and yeah as dean said like it's something that you can work up to you can work up to be batman which is awesome of course i would love to have millions of dollars but (laughs) (laughs) no but but like it's actually like something like it's not dumb to say you could work your way up to being incorruptible? Well, now I know that I'm corruptible. (laughs) (laughs) Um. (laughs) See? Spoken like an Iron Man. We've got two people on the podcast that Batman's better than. (laughs) We're counting down. (laughs) So, Cole, is Batman better than you? Yeah. (laughs) That's three. One one thing I wanted to say, I think, is, is... I feel fairly sh- strongly about the fact that I, I think that superheroes should be like it's anytime you imagine a superhero, you the one of the the next thought you have is what is the weakness? You know what I'm saying? I think that there's always needs to be some kind of flaw, and I think that there needs to be some kind of sacrifice involved with superheroes. And and I I'm I'm a slightly darker person. So I recognize that I, I lean towards these things, but I always like to think that like, like S- Spider-Man or when, it, when you get your superpowers, that needs to be the time when your life gets hard. Your life needs to get worse after you get your powers. Now, well, how does that apply to Batman? Because again, like we said, he decided to become a superhero, then worked his way up to being a superhero. So Batman... I feel like Batman, even though he is better than us and he's inspirational and stuff, he, st- he, he always works best, for me at least, when he is a tragic character. And the, tragic, the tragedy of him is that he can't stop being Batman. And he, like you said, like, there's no release for your, your philosophies. Well, there's no release for Batman. Mm-hmm. And the, the perfect end for Batman is dying alone, right? Like he's, he's going to, he's, it's the mission. And he, you know, other people like, you know, I, we talk, he talks a lot about it. Uh, they, they touch on this a lot in Batman Beyond because we have like a very aged Bruce Wayne. Mm-hmm. And the other people couldn't hack it. They all left for real lives or they all stopped for whatever reason. And he's still going, you know, and he's like 70s, 80s, you know, and it's, and it's him. He's pressing forward. And I feel like that's where his tragedy is. That's where his, his sacrifice is. Is that he can't, you know, he has, he has billions of dollars. He can't, he can't enjoy that those billion of do- billions of dollars. He can't stop and get married. He can't, you know, he can't have a family. I mean, he builds his own family, sure. But and I'm, I, I think I'm probably throwing him in a little more of a, a more tragic light. But this is. I what think fascinates- what you're saying is that the major tragedy of Batman is that he's too awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Just like when you go to stop. the. It's like when you go to a job interview, you're like, what's your weakness? Like, well, I'm right. a perfectionist. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that is yeah. a good point. Batman uh, really has a hard time but, stopping. I have an idea for a last story of Batman, but it is really, 
it's still being Batman just secretly. <laughs> <laughs> the dude can't quit. But it's yeah. because he's driven by such a true thing. Um, I'm going to uh, say the cockiest thing I've ever said in my life. And I'm, I like pretending to be cocky in order to be confident because I have uh, a lot of insecurity. But I'm going to tell you the cockiest thing I've ever said. Everyone record this. Um, I'm better than Batman. And the reason why I'm better than Batman is because I have the same level of tragedy driving me and I'm open about it. Batman's keeping it all in. And I was until this year. And I think Batman could really solve some stuff in his town if he just manned up and told people, hey, yeah, okay, so it's me. I've been Batman this whole time. And you guys have seen that and you're welcome and all that. But <laughs> it's because of this thing that happened to me that you, some of you will be able to relate to. And I'm telling you so that you can help deal with the things in your lives. I've told like my closest allies, but now I'm telling everyone and uh, my address is right over there. I'm Batman, and here's why. Because I went through this. And the city rises up in solidarity with that moment and saves itself. Batman can't do that because he's fictional and he has to keep going. Yeah. That was interesting. <laughs> the, well, first of all, Cole, when you first said that, oh, the final Batman story, he should die alone, I was so signed off on that. I was like, check out, no way, because he's got the Bat family. But then you pointed out that, yeah, no, he's more driven than everybody else. And, yeah, it was shown in Batman Beyond that, like, here he is, like, having to recruit more poor kids to do yeah, it. And I think, I think yeah. the last Batman story would be something like he's coming to a realization that he's going to die and... Therefore, he drives everyone close to him away to protect them. And then he sacrifices himself. Do you want to know mine? It's not far off. Mm. Yeah. All right. So let's just, if I ever get to write this for DC, uh, everybody acts surprised. So <laughs> oh. the idea for me, for the last story of Batman, is that he, he puts it together that everything in Gotham is reacting to him and the Joker. They're the first two major players. Everything is a reaction to him. There's people on his side. There's other criminals trying to emulate the Joker. There's people emulating him. Everything is a reaction to these two major forces. The police, the populace, the government. It's all held in check by these two, this unstoppable force, this immovable chaos, right? So you know how the Joker's always falling to his death and then his body's never found? Batman decides to jump after him and change the story. And he falls publicly to his death and neither of their bodies are found. So Batman and the Joker are dead. This changes everything in the city in that the bat signal never goes off. It's, he's not coming back. We want him to come back. We need him to come back. But people in the city start wearing little R's on their shirts to let people know that they're in the Robin flock. They're people who would report crimes to the police. The police knows Batman's not going to cover their slack anymore, so they have to step up. The network of Robins is kind of social media driven, and, and crime starts going down. The bat signal is not bringing Batman back, so people start building their own on their rooftops, like homemade makeshift bat signals. The whole sky is littered with them. Gotham's a city of light now, even at night. Uh, it's safe. Bruce Wayne's fine. He runs for mayor. He's living in the penthouse. He deals with Tim, who's now Nightwing. There's a girl named Robin One who coordinates the network of Robins. And in his penthouse, Batman has the Joker. Bruce Wayne's trying to cure him himself. The problem with the Joker isn't that Batman needs to kill him. It's that he needs a jailer and a therapist who will actually get the job done. Mm. I like that. Yeah. Mm. I like that. Again, spoilers for right, right. future comics. And I think I think that that's I mean, that's a that's a great story and I think that um I read somewhere that like somebody said Batman is like Shakespeare, you can adapt him. You know what I'm saying? There's there's so like that's such that's such a, that's what's so wonderful about Batman is there's room mm -hmm. for that story. And I can like that story as much as I like Dark Knight Returns, and mm -hmm. I don't have to say, but they don't fit together. You know what right. I'm saying? <laughs> um, yeah, continuity is, like, fluid. Yeah. You don't have to worry about it. That's why All-Star Superman is the best Superman story ever. It's, like, continuity light. 
Like you, it's, right. it's everything you could say to somebody on the street. Like when I always use this example, but when, when Dick Grayson took over for Batman, that's something you can explain to somebody. Like, yeah, Robin's Batman now because he grew up, and the new Robin's Batman's like crazy kid raised by assassins. He's like a total badass. Right. You can say that to anybody. When that was happening and there was like that whole battle for the cowl thing, I was working in a comic shop, and the guy's like, no, no, it's going to be Jason Todd and Tim. And it's like, no, because you know how dumb that sounds if you're trying to explain it to somebody? Okay, so like there have been a lot of Robins, and um, the second <laughs> one who died – um, Superboy Prime, who's like Superboy from a different reality, he punched time, and then Jason's back, and then he <laughs> had something to do with the Lazarus pit, but That's... he came back with guns. But now he's good, and he was the Red Hood for a while, and so Batman's him. And then the third, you know, yeah, you can't do that. You, you have to keep it simple because it has to feel like part of reality. Like, right, right. You know? Right, right. And marketable. Right. Can, right. can we round back on something that you guys were saying earlier? And I want to I want to touch on the thing that you said, Dean, that I think is really interesting. Is um, so, Cole, you said there always has to be a sacrifice to be a hero. Um, and to which I go, oh, really? It does. Is that always the case? You know, or is that just part of Cole's recipe? You know, like that's an interesting idea. And then Dean saying, I'm better than Batman because I went public with my. It's the craziest thing I've ever said. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Standing by it for now. But. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this is, this is an interesting... So, going public, you said. Now, now we should say that in Something Terrible, it chronicles... The, the, Something Terrible itself was the public statement of this thing that happened to you. That, you know, it, it truly was terrible. And I'm sure it was very scary to tell the whole world in your medium of choice. I'm sure that was not an easy decision to make and not an easy thing to commit to paper, right? Um, so there's a sacrifice there. It was all digital, so it was super easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially that spread with the uh, where the boy walks into the room full of heroes. Just and... took 120 hours, no yeah. problem. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm thinking that there's, you're making yourself vulnerable to the world, and there's a different kind of sacrifice, which... I, I assume benefited your life in some substantial ways since. Um, it's funny. You'd think it, it really did feel like uh, exposing your secret identity is, is one of those things where it's like, yeah, I'm making myself vulnerable. But it, it kind of had the opposite effect, kind of like Tony Stark at the end of Iron Man, where it's just like, yeah, what do you got now? Like the mm. darkest secret that I didn't want anyone to know that I was a victim of childhood sexual violence is now super public. I've did this story that's helping people all over the world. And – Anyone who's ever questioned my intentions or motives or, or what I'm about, it's all there if you want to read it. If you don't, fine. I'm doing what I'm doing because I'm driven to help people. And uh, it's like my mission statement. I feel really good, like bulletproof. Like I don't need the cape and the cowl anymore. Okay, well, I want to drive into like a slightly divergent area with this because I think it's interesting about that is – just on the way here, Rachel, we were having a conversation, and it was based on something that you actually were commenting on, Dean, about um, oh that that gal who was getting harassed online because she made some comments about a Teen Titans cover. Janelle Ellen. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, and uh, she what what did she say? She just said she didn't like the cover. She pointed out a few reasons why it was what, not a good cover by by her standards. And then next panel two, rape threats. Right. Right. And and I, and I was telling. Yeah, so she's pointing out the inherent sexism of some of the things that are going on in comic books, and then uh, in order to defeat her arguments, uh, more sexism in comic book world. <laughs> gotcha, lady. <laughs> like, the people who are the most problematic keep proving it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. So but so here I am. I'm talking with Rachel on the drive here, and I'm thinking, gosh, you know, young gal, she's going to get more involved in the comics world, and. Well, I'm not your dad. I'm old enough to be your dad. And I think about that, and it scares me a little bit. And I'm like, gosh, you know, like, I'm going to have her on my show. Is that putting her up for, you know, getting uh, weirdos yelling at her and attacking her? And maybe maybe secret identities are good. Maybe keeping a little bit back from being too public prevents, like, the internet trolls, hate speech, and all of this stuff. What would be your answer to that? Uh, like, Dean, like, babe, 
being public and being I honest have a is always... lot of friends who are uh, women working in comics yeah. and and girls who are fans of comics. I I really a lot of my fan base is is women, especially after something terrible. I expected dudes to write me who'd been through similar experiences, but because of the incidence of violence is against women is so much higher. Uh, I was surprised by how many women related to the story, in, especially in terms of the fears that were associated with it. Anyway, uh, I would say that the problem with the world is that you're going to encounter that kind of crap no matter what industry you're in. And uh, I am personally more disgusted by the one that gave me such strength and hope and continues to like do that for people all over the world, especially as these movies have become so popular. Uh, the, the people who are fans of it would be sexist, racist, homophobic, judging people for who they are rather than uh, protecting and celebrating differences and, and togetherness. It's disgusting. I, I think if you say sexist stuff in comic book world, you've just proven you don't understand superheroes at all. Going back to Cole's initial point, if you don't love Batman, you don't love humanity. So right. if, you, if you don't love humanity, you don't love Batman. You really don't understand Batman if you don't love Batman. Done people. and done. Title of the episode. You loop it around. <laughs> yeah. You tied that up in a bat bow, brother. <laughs> but, but okay, so, so then you would argue that you're going to encounter it anyway in being public and being... I don't have a friend who's a girl that hasn't. It's, yeah. uh, it's just this pervasive sexism, sexism in our culture. Um, it's... Pretty terrible. I mean, things are getting better. That's the, the only reason I'm an angry and hopeful person. Like, you know, in the Green Lantern multi core color spectrum, yes. like hope and anger cancel each other out or something. Mm -hmm. uh, that's dumb. I'm angry and very optimistic. And I think you need both. I'm angry about the state of things and hopeful because if you look at the long view, things are improving all over the world. Like, there are things that suck and it's getting better slowly. And if it wasn't, I'd just be angry and crying all the time um but i, I think that that scene in the avengers where it's like that's my secret cap i'm always angry that has touched a deep part of me in my heart um because i am i'm just i'm really i don't understand people who would hurt other people i don't i don't get it i don't know what's going wrong in in humans especially men uh who are perpetuating most of the violence like not it's not just men men's right activists hey Go to hell. So <laughs> it's 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 this problem with men who are making boys feel like they're not manly enough if they're not jerks. You know, yeah. I, I don't get it. It it's never appealed to me. But I grew up with a lot of sci-fi and superheroes, so I lucked out. Yeah, I, I remember the first time I saw uh, a pacifist hero. Uh, it was Hawk and Dove. Actually, mm -hmm. yeah, it, uh, this was before they had the pacifist hero on G.I. Joe, uh, which I was watching as a kid. But mm -hmm. I remember that was like that was like a thunderbolt. Like, that's a choice. You get mm -hmm. to choose not to fight. And that's courageous because that's not the best I'm getting from place else. I watched Rambo. <laughs> you know? yeah. So, man, I feel like we need to rope Brandon Dayton in on this. I know this is a topic that's near and dear to his heart. It's this whole idea of um, the way we're raising boys in this world. Uh, and, and perpetuating some of these ideas. But on a lighter note, uh, I'm wondering if anybody watched this episode today and said, boy, oh boy, these guys really, really love Batman. I wonder what there is. If there's some, you know, maybe there's a Batman for me. Uh, if, can we think of what is our personal number one Batman to get introduced to uh, the, the, the world of Batman? Should we start with Detective Comics number 27, or is there an, a, an issue or storyline or book <laughs> That made you say, oh, that's what makes him work for me, and I love him. Uh, do you want to start, Rach? Oh, man. Well, like I told you, my my first Batman comic, and the one that just got me into, like, really got me into comic books was The Killing Joke. All right. Well, what was it about it that grabbed you? Besides Brian Bond's amazing art. Oh, my goodness. It's so good. <laughs> um, that's, I guess, that's, that was the point when I realized that, like... I had seen Batman, like I had seen the movies, and like I had friends who were absolutely obsessed with Batman, yeah. and um, <laughs> the Adam West Batman film is one of my favorites. Oh, I love that movie. No, I... <laughs> um, but that was the point when I realized that Batman is not 
immortal. Mm. And I loved that because mm. uh, I, I had always... Um, like, you have your Superman who's, like, indestructible. Mm -hmm. and I, I mean, they all have their flaws, but, like, mm -hmm. um, Batman truly is mortal. But he makes himself immortal mm. in some ways. Yeah. Um, and that was awesome. And, like, the um, his ability to um, comfort and fix um, with whatever situation it is, it's... It was awesome to me, and like that—that's what grabbed me. The, the killing. Remind me. I mean, because it's been years since I've read the Killing yeah. Joke. The Killing Joke is the one where the Joker does something really, really bad to somebody close to Batman. Right? Yes, he uh, shoots Barbara Gordon. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was trying to avoid the spoiler. <laughs> For the people who get upset, I personally <laughs> don't. Know. Thirty years later. Man. I know. What's the statute of limitations on that, right? But uh, if you're watching this, you don't love Batman. <laughs> <laughs> Not <laughs> so, but so th th that that human made him even more human to you. Yeah, you're I mean, he he has like it. It showed things get to him, yeah, <laughs> like a real person. Yeah, um, he's not indestructible mm -hmm. by any means, but he knows what his flaws are, and then he's he's able to identify that and build himself up. Yeah, and um. Now the Joker is an awful person, uh, <laughs> to say the least. But yeah. um, that that grabbed me. Yeah. The the fact that you don't have to be immortal, you don't have to have superpowers to be a superhero. And plus, let's face it, the Joker is cathartically cool. Awesome. He's he's an amazing <laughs> dresser. He has an, an impeccable style and and a self confidence that many people would die for. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I'm just gonna update my criminals list with your name, okay? <laughs> 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 I'm not saying we should emulate the Joker. I'm just saying there's something that no, is... No, no, you just think he's cool. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've been keeping track of people who cosplay as the Joker. Uh, I never cosplayed no reason, as the no Joker. No reason at all. No. I dressed as Batman as a child, never dressed as the Joker. But I'm just saying Look, that there's something... Oh, there's something. Oh, there's something cathartic yeah. about villains. Cole, what were you going to say? Save me. Oh. Uh, do you want to talk? Do you want me to talk about... Your pick? The Batman that, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I think, like I said, Batman's, he's adaptable. And, and I, I, there's a lot of different Batmans. And you can, you can pick which one you like. And, and, you know, for me, like I said, Batman's always, first and foremost, a detective and somebody who is, is playing a game of cat and mouse in his mind as he tries to, you know, bring these people in. Um, I, you know, I... It was funny. I had a friend uh, read the Killing Joke, or not the Killing Joke. Sorry, uh, Long Halloween, mm -hmm. and we were and the ending. And I won't give it away, but it has. There's some. Oh, it's um. <laughs> <laughs> there's some ambiguity to it, uh, mm -hmm. to what's going on at the end. And I, I was, you know, the first time I read it, it was it was it confused me. And then the second time I read it, I was like, oh, this is obvious. Like I, I, you know, formulated. And I got online and read some people's, you know, and one of them was like, hey, you know, Batman is the greatest detective in the DC universe. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, if he hasn't figured it out, then, you know, and one of my friends is like, well, I don't think he's the best detective. And I'm like, you're dead to me. Like, <laughs> like, like, yeah, there's a lot of different Batmans, but Batman, um, Anyway, so I think I think that you can. The nice thing about Batman is you can kind of pick and choose what you what you want. Like you know, there are Batman's. There's there's uh, the um, Frank Miller's later work. It has Batman being very sadistic and very um, angry. And you know, I can read that and say that's not my Batman. You know, and um, it's but crazy, I think isn't it? There's no one whose work like has been more lauded and then more like repulsive because of. It's right. like this shift. It's like what he thinks was cool about Dark Knight Returns is not what we thought was cool about it. Right. It's a little George Lucas. -ish, like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it really like, is. No, no, this isn't what we thought was cool. Mm -mm. We, we thought Jedis were cool or the Force or whatever. Yeah. yeah anyway, um, yeah. and I, I, Whole other was, episode right there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
that's not going to turn off by the way. Okay. Um, anyway, so uh, I, I feel like um, for me, the guy, the, the one that hits the closest um, is Bruce Timm's Batman. Mm. Bruce Timm's Batman, I feel like it encapsulates what I, what I think of him the most because, you know, yeah, he's a detective, but Batman's also a fighter. Like that's something that's kind of different. They've, they've put that into Sherlock Holmes later. Uh, guy Ritchie has but Sherlock's not a fighter you know what I'm saying but Batman is and so you need to have that balance but I hate when we err too stuck too much on the side of the fighter and not the detective I'd prefer that to err on the side of the detective but ultimately you know I think he does and I think the stuff that Denny O'Neill did that he kind of brought it back around um I think that we have Bruce Timm's Batman because of Denny O'Neill mm. um you know what I'm saying? Like I, I, but again, like I just love, you know, like I just recently reread um, Batman Earth One, which is a great retelling, you know, and it's a little bit different. Um, it's where we get the idea of Alfred being a, uh, I think this is where we get the idea of Alfred being like this uh, ex-Royal Marine MI6. It, that's a pretty old idea, but it's it's focused on a lot more in Earth One. Yeah, it felt if like I I know that like in the uh, in the in the Bruce Tim show they talked about him having like a he was kind of like um, in the. It's from the comics too. It, it goes yeah. back, but it's they they really played it up in that one. Yeah, they played it up, and then and then we have you know now we have Beware, Beware the Batman, which has a very you know where Alfred is way less butlerly, and he's way more like aggressive like he's like a uh, you know he's an ex special forces guy mm -hmm. um but but these things all work in the world of batman it's okay like you know it's like that's sweet you know my alfred is a butler and he is the butler from the animated series but i like seeing him as my a... word <laughs> yeah exactly that's mine too man <laughs> And, and we, while you were talking about the Bruce Tim Batman, we were watching footage of uh, we were actually playing footage on the screen of the 75th anniversary short that Bruce Tim did. And I love the fact that like it, when the plane comes in, Batman's plane comes in, and he takes this canister, puts it in the gun because Batman doesn't use guns. Puts this canister right. in the gun, and it clearly says tear gas <laughs> across it. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah, like Batman. Yeah, he, I'm I'm pretty sure he hates guns, not hates ammunition. <laughs> Am I right about that? <laughs> No ammunition. <laughs> right. <laughs> no right. bullets. But I just love that there that was that was they put such a lampshade on that by like with the big letters tear gas. Um yeah. Well and I think I think that, that that short is definitely a throwback, right? Like his design is very reminiscent of the of the first appearance with the gloves and his, you know, the the more of a hooked kind of horn ears. Um and you know, Batman was using guns then. Uh, and I, 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 I thought that was a great little retro kind of throwback to early, you know, it, I mean, we even had like a kind of a serial film grain film, yeah. you know, scratches on it and stuff like that. So I, I but, but again, you know, it works. I liked it Batman. too. I liked it too, but it is just one side of Batman. I thought that was, you know, last year they did the 75th anniversary Superman one where it kind of went, it left out some important Supermans, but it went through the evolution of Superman. And I, I remember when that posted, I was like, this is awesome. Now where's Batman? And I was kind of hoping we'd get that this year, but I'm sure Tim didn't want to replace himself uh, or repeat himself. Um, mm -hmm. I'm also a big animated series guy. Kevin Conroy's is the voice that I hear in my head when I think about Batman. Um, but I did want to say Paul Dini also. Because yeah. the thing about Batman, and it's all in the first origin story, uh, but it's trained his mind to be a brilliant scientist. He trained his body to be an Olympic athlete. You know, he learned the ways of crime and forensics, and it's all of it. You need all of it because he's not – superheroes are a thing that's it's it grows out of the pulp heroes and the mythical heroes before and folk heroes, but it, it's this synthesis that crosses over into its new thing, and Batman doesn't have any power, so why is he different from the Shadow? And, you know, it's, it's all of this stuff combined together, and uh, I think his longevity is because of all of it. Um, I thought that short was good, but it – it, I, I wanted to hear Kevin Conroy a whole lot more. Like he's got yeah. like one line. 
Yeah. Um, but speaking of like favorite Batman stories to get people into, uh, my favorite isn't a Batman story. It's a Robin story. Uh, but Batman is a really good father figure in it. I read it when I was in my 20s, but it's called Robin Year One. It's by Chuck Dixon and Scott Beatty with art by Javier Polito, and I think Marcos Martin may have worked on it. I know he, he drew the Batgirl Year One that follows it that's also really good. Um, my friend Lee Lowridge colored it, and it was before I met him, and it was, it was the biggest coloring influence on me entirely. But it's it's kind of got an animated series-ish kind of style, but it's the story of Dick Grayson, his first year with Bruce, and what that relationship is like and uh, Alfred being kind of a mentor to both of them and, and how Bruce deals with having a kid in the cave and how he likes it because, you know, Grant talked about this in an interview with Kevin Smith, uh, Grant Morrison, but it's when Bruce meets Dick Grayson, Dick's this kid who gets to be everything Bruce didn't get to be. And Dick looks up to Bruce because he's everything he wants to be. And so their relationship is is kind of parental, kind of big brothery. Uh, but it really is just seeing themselves in each other and uh, helping each other accomplish the goals they both have for fighting all the crime. Um, but yeah, Robin Year One, that's the one I usually recommend to people because it's uh, a way yeah. in. Robin is intended to be a path into Batman because he's he's more identifiable. He's less so mythical. You know, Robin's like a kid and he fights crime and it's great. There's nothing <laughs> – anyone who makes fun of Robin's an idiot. There's nothing better than seeing a 10-year-old – kick a bad guy in the head <laughs> that's going in the tease for this one um all right well we got book recommendations can you guys believe it's already been over an hour i i i told rachel it's gonna go fast and it goes so fast um especially when you're talking about things that you love a lot so okay um we gotta say goodbye to rachel because um rachel moyer is coming in another rachel to uh do some book recommendations on the behalf of a rachel Adrian. replacement Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> So I've actually got to go because school's about to let out. Oh my gosh! Okay, well, Dean Tripp, thank you so much for being here, uh, and thanks for making time to to share all of your passion about Batman. I hope we can have you on again in the near future, talk more superhero Anytime, stuff. Anytime, buddy. And thanks for asking me to talk about Batman. It was really good talking with you, Cole. I thought you had tons of great points about Batman. And uh, for my book recommendation, I'd recommend Something Terrible by yes. Dean Tripp. <laughs> That's my <laughs> book recommendation. It's a dollar. It's a digital download for just a dollar. You can find the link at deantrip.com. All right. Well, that everybody it's, should go there twice and get two. Get one for a friend. Uh, that's right. You sh and if you read it twice, just download it again. <laughs> <laughs> just buy cool. it every time you want to read it. Thanks again, Dean. And um, we'll, we'll link to that in the show notes as well. We'll, we'll be Thanks seeing you. Thanks so much, guys. It was really great. And uh, uh, y'all have a good discussion without me. And bye. We'll see ya. It's good meeting you, Dean. You too, man. All right, so, um, well, Rachel, where should people go today to check out some of the stuff that you do? Uh, I have my own website, rachelpolk.com. Rachelpolk.com. And that's your portfolio? Yes, that is so, my portfolio. Because you are a mercenary. <laughs> you, you, do, you do the drawings for the money. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I will say, I mean, this is my public endorsement. You <clears throat> are a fabulous pr production assistant. Oh, oh my God. You. You, the, the Warren Report book that I'm working on now, it would not get done if it wasn't for you oh my gosh <laughs> yeah you made you helped me so much on that book and i know we're not quite done yet we got a little ways to go yet but i mean so close. we're so close because of you and i mean seriously folks i cannot recommend her enough if you need some production work color work uh flatting work on your comic so uh okay rachelpolk.com is where people can find that and you've also got too many comics people can find Ew. which are what uh, what is what is what are these what does your cat do when you can't find him which is uh so I don't know if here I can hold it up while you talk yeah. about it. Uh, for cat owners, uh, <laughs> um, if you have a cat, uh, you cannot find it unless it wants to be found. That is like uh, the the biggest thing that <laughs> I learned when I had a cat. <clears throat> um, so pretty much, I just made a mini comic of like what your cat does when you can't find it, because like you know, ghost. To a comic convention, goes and to the zoo, and and so has on. As a rave party, the rave party is the best one. Well, that and the t it stands at the top of your staircase is pretty good too. Waiting to kill you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Cats. and then I have uh, Melvin the fat bird, which, which is, is uh, <laughs> the best description. We we uh, Jersey and I went to a 
uh, Entertainment Expo two weeks ago. Yeah. And uh, the best pitch that we found for this was it's about a fat bird who poops on a kid's head. <laughs> <laughs> More happens in the story. Yay! But, but that is that is one of the things that happens in there. So and that's how it becomes appealing to ten year olds. <laughs> hey, Matt, I'm gonna fr I'm gonna frame Cole up while we make the switch. So but so those we can find at at Rachel Polk. Well, not yet. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna put those up. Um, but also my uh, my Tumblr, which is Mercury Whale. Um, actually, you can find me anywhere as Mercury Whale. Um, but yeah, I'll I'll be putting those up. Okay, and uh, your Merc Mercury Mercury Whale on Twitter, Mercury Twitter, Whale, Twitter, Tumblr, Tumblr, Instagram, Instagram, yeah, all that. Okay, so cool. Well, thank you for being here, Rachel. Yeah, and thanks thank for contributing for to the discussion, <laughs> and uh, hope to do it again. All oh right. Boy. So while we switch the Rachels, uh, Cole, did you have any other book recommendations you want to throw out, or do we do mine? Yeah, um, I would say I would recommend um, Arkham Asylum by Grant Morrison and Dean uh, Dave McKean, but I want to I want to add like a a caveat there. I think or a suggestion I should say. I I have an interesting history with this book because I tried to buy it as a as a fourteen year old, and I was walking around the comic shop with it, and then ultimately the com the comic shop guy came up to me and said, "Hey, I can't sell that to you because it's for suggested for mature readers." Wow. And I was I was like, what? I mean, of course, like as a teenager, that's just humiliation <laughs> to have it happen. Yeah. Uh, I can't sell you something too young. Um, so it wasn't until years and years later that I tracked it down and read it. Um, and when I read it, I was kind of like, that was cool. Like that was like, yeah, I didn't understand some of it. Like, you know, but then I read like most, if you read the uh, – the anniversary, I think it's like the 10th anniversary, or whatever, 10th, 20th anniversary edition. It has the screenplay, it has a script in the back of it. And I read the script and it blew me away. Like, it was just like, he, like, and I really like Dave McKean as an artist, but I feel like something was really lost between the writing of it and the actual art, hmm. which is not something you want to say vocally on a comics podcast. <laughs> The the script is where it was at. Uh, you know uh, what? It made it made me understand what he was trying to do, and there was a lot of complexity in it. So I would suggest reading that, but making sure you read the script in the back because mm. it's it, it's a great Batman story. Hmm. All right. Well, cool. We added that to the list too. Arkham Asylum and Eric Kloster is in the chat uh, collecting and, all these. And things. then we have uh, we have all of the Arkham like Arkham Origins was kind of based off of that. Not Arkham Origins, Arkham Asylum, Batman Arkham Asylum, the, the video game. Then we had Arkham City, then we have Arkham Origins, and then we're having Arkham Knight, which are all uh, fantastic, except Arkham Origins because they shipped before they actually got all their bugs fixed. But other than that, it was awesome. Okay, cool. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> well, you warned me. You warned me in the email. It's like, don't get me started on Batman. Uh, but uh, okay. But Rachel Moyer is here of comics.aadl.org. Comics at aadl.org. Um, Despite the fact that they sound exactly the same, those were two different things. Yes, website and, and email. Ads. One is a website, so, one is an email. Okay, so now I have to ask you, uh, who would win in a fight, Batman or Superman? <sighs> they don't need to fight. They're friends. Because <laughs> I know you're, you're a big Superman fan. So. I am a big Superman fan, and I feel like part of my um, lack of feelings about uh, Batman has to do more with the culture that surrounds him in certain circles in comicdom than the character himself but mm -hmm. because of that I don't have any Batman recommendations with me I figured I'd leave it to you guys because you're yeah no we got I'm more of a bat fam friend fan than a Batman oh that's fan, true so. Oracle Barbara yeah. I know you're a big fan of her so and yeah. and birds of prey tied into that quite a bit oh yeah, uh, yeah. all the Batgirls yeah in fact yeah. if we had had copies of uh, the Cascane Batgirl trades here at AADL I'd be recommending that but uh, I do have kind of a rule for myself. I'm not going to recommend things if you can't find them here. Ah. Uh, which, I mean, that covers most things. We have a pretty awesome collection. But yeah, I say that, and then awesome I'm going to break that rule immediately. Oh, uh, with my first rec. Is this, is this a pre-pub? No. It, it's, no, it actually just came out this it week. Just came um, out. It's not in trade yet, so it's not going to be here. Oh, and hope. that is 
my first recommendation, Lumberjanes, which if you have not picked this up, you really should. It is delightful. I was trying to remember um, what their elevator pitch was for it uh, in the last cast. I know I was stumbling all over it, but their elevator pitch is Gravity Falls meets Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh, wow. So it's five girls at a summer camp that is just rife with supernatural mysteries and uh, shenanigans. So <laughs> it is uh, really dynamic art, really a lot of fun. Um, there's a really, it's uh, written by Noel Stevenson, which I know Tumblr famous. If if, if you've ever know. been on Tumblr, yeah, you've you, seen her work at some yeah, point or another. Yeah, at some point or another, you know, <laughs> Bro Ship of the Rings or all her little. Uh, yeah. She's got a bunch of Winter Soldier cartoons that have been making the rounds. But no, it's a really great read. And um, I think the. The idea behind the whole push with it is really great. It is meant to be, you know, a book about friendship and awesome things for girls. And it's not, like, just for girls, obviously, because so in other it's words, universal. It's about, but it's about girls saying, what kind of lipstick do you wear? What kind of lipstick do you wear, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> and, like, that's oh, that very... boy is cute. I wish he liked me a lot. That's I such wish a dude question. <laughs> <laughs> What's it like to be a woman in comics, Rachel? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I know, I know. Mm -hmm, I'm yeah. making fun. So. I know, I know. So, uh, but no. So, Lumberjanes. Uh, Lumberjanes. Check it out. Great read. Only the first issue is out. It just came out this past Wednesday. But mm. if you have a few bucks in your pocket and you're over by the shop, or maybe at the vault. toss them a yeah. one of these. So I know okay. And then, what, what's this? I see okay. Wonder oh, oh. I didn't even think about this until I got into the studio. But the cover of this other wreck is kind of... Um, <laughs> not appropriate a, to the show, or yeah. not appropriate if, depending how you look at it, it's Batman's head getting stepped on. Oops. Yeah. Um, but this is Wonder Woman. The okay, and this is gonna be another one of those things I mangle. It's like an ongoing joke. I can't s pronounce anything. Uh, uh, the Hikatea, Hikatea, yeah. Um, right. it's uh, Greg Rekka, uh, who's always great. Yeah, and JG Jones. So, um, it's. It poses a philosophical question about justice. Um, and you do have Wonder Woman and Batman facing off in it. But why I like this book is it poses sort of a philosophical question about justice and, like, who needs to be protected and what's justice for someone who is, you know, maybe seeking justice themselves in a violent manner. Because mm. uh, what you have is you have Wonder Woman sworn through this sort of um, sacred process, Greek vow to protect this woman that Batman is seeking uh, to bring to justice for the murder of several men. Um, and there's a, she has a very, um, a very good reason to have gone after these men. And uh, Wonder Woman is sworn to protect her, so it puts them at odds. And it, I really like it because it doesn't resolve the issue. It presents the question and uh, the specific problem is resolved, as uh -huh. it were, not in a particularly happy way, but it's resolved. So but that you no know, you don't have Wonder Woman, and Batman killing each other, hooray! And you don't have Batman no saying that. to Wonder Woman, "I guess you were right," or Wonder Woman saying to no. Batman, "I guess you were right." Right? No, it leaves the question open ended, which I think is pretty effective and it, not at all common in these kind of books. So I I appreciate that. And I should say, despite the fact that Wonder er, Wonder Woman is stepping on Batman's head, it is not an anti-Batman book. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you this. When you say it ends unresolved, it doesn't end with Batman saying, well, I guess nobody knows the answer. Do you? There's no, it, <laughs> it's not It's not that on the nose. <laughs> okay, so. good. No, it's a very good yeah, Greg Wonder Ruck Wonder is usually book. more subtle than that. Yeah. Uh, so right. the next one I recognize, yes, uh, and this former is, guest of the show. Oh, and I love her. That's Faith Erin Hicks's uh, The Adventures of Superhero Girl, which is like a humorous slice of life superhero uh, webcomic that was collected yeah. about a Canadian uh, superhero named Superhero Girl. And it's you've got stuff like her going to a job interview and the king of ninjas, uh, evil villain, deciding that he's going to interview the job too because he's, you know, he's her nemesis. He's going to thwart her in every way possible and then succeeding through business and turning over a new leaf by beating her up for the job she wants or forgetting to take her mask off while she's just going around daily life and it's just a lot of fun it's a really good lighthearted romp i'd say 
Sweet. Oh, okay. So, um, and that is from Dark Horse. Uh, yes, Dark Horse. Published. And didn't the, did, was this the one that was up for an Eisner, or was it one of her other books that? Because like Ray, Faith Aaron Hicks is sweeping the Eisners like it, again. You know, I don't know off the top of my head, but I feel like if one of her works was up for an Eisner, it was probably Fun with or um, Friends with Boys. Okay. Okay. Because that is uh, more of a cohesive story, whereas this is more strip style. Okay. Well, there's a story throughout, but it's uh, a little bit more easy to read each strip on their own. All right, and then the last one. Oh, my last gosh, this one. is a big one. Okay, I went through the archives. I don't think this specific book has been uh, wrecked before. I know we have wrecked some of his stuff. This is um, Naoki Urasawa's Pluto. Yes. And I know 21st Century Boys has been mentioned a few times on the yep. cast before. Um, he is just a master. And the, Pluto is especially exciting because it's not just his mastery at work here. It's actually... Um, Sort of a re, well, not sort of. It's a retelling of uh, Astro Boy, a specific arc in Astro Boy. Yep. Uh, it's a sort of really tense murder mystery that has to do with uh, both robots and humans, and what it means to be a robot, what it means to be human. Um, I want to see if I can find this the the, the moment that uh, like just crippled me emotionally. Is it, is it the uh, the wife? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So the, there's a moment, and I, this isn't too huge a spoiler, so I feel like we're okay talking about it, but um, yeah. there's a moment where um, the main character, who is himself a robot, but he's a more humanoid robot, he uh, uh, has to go to the wife of a uh, much more you know, sci-fi sort of robot to inform her that he was killed in the line of duty. Mm. So it's a interesting way of portraying the grief of this really inhuman character that doesn't have human expression, can't have human expression, but still putting that really palpable grief on the page. Yeah, so good. Uh -huh. and, and, and the crazy thing is, is like this was just like this kind of silly Tezuka story, and the Tezuka stuff is awesome, mm -hmm. but it was a very silly story about a giant robot named Pluto that goes mm -hmm. around killing all the robots to prove that he's the greatest robot of all time. Right. You read the original, it's very campy, fun, punch mm -hmm. him up, and then Urasawa gets a hold of that story and, and turns it, just, it into this super tense yeah super intense story uh and the the mystery is like uh, there's someone going around which the story is named for in pluto, pluto who is targeting this uh, i think it's the seven great robots yeah. so all the biggest best most advanced robots there are uh the main character Gishisht, is one of them the first victim is one of them and he's like a really uh well-loved uh, hero. Mont Blanc. Mont Blanc, yes. Yeah. And also a robots rights activist. And those are the two first victims. And they are they know that this is connected because the killer leaves horns pressed to their heads. Yeah. Uh, referencing um, specifically Pluto from, uh, well I guess if we're using the name Pluto, it's Roman mythology. Roman mythology. Uh, well done. So, <laughs> I have to catch myself there. But um you do it, it it kind of takes place a little bit on the periphery of the original source material uh -huh. um as like astro boy is not the center of it no. he does show up he does show up as, but yeah but um ursa is just a master and i actually have faith aaron hicks to thank personally for turning me on to Urasawa because i had not read any of his stuff and then she had mentioned him as an art influence and i went out and read all his stuff but uh it, in terms of storytelling in terms of rendering faces he does really good face uh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's such a problem that almost sounded like a doge statement <laughs> uh too much time on the internet possibly <laughs> i'm in grad school we take yeah. any kind of entertainment we can yeah. get um but no uh there you know every artist has a trouble with like differentiating faces at some point or another yeah. it, it just gets it's, it's hard yes, we co it's people complain about same face and that's legitimate but um you know it's difficult but he really doesn't seem to have trouble with it which i know is probably something learned more than anything else but yeah. uh he has such a huge variety of uh character designs in there it's really great well, cool. Well, no, I can't recommend enough. Pluto's amazing. So uh, that, that's a really terrific series, and it's like six or six volumes or eight volumes. In I it. think it's eight volumes. Eight volumes. So it is a manga with an end. Yeah, and I believe um, the third volume actually has the original story reprinted in it. Oh, does it? At least uh, oh. I, I seem to recall it 
reading that somewhere that oh. the American edition does have the original story reprinted yeah, in one of the volumes of Pluto, so you can kind of compare. Yeah, because it is hard to track down the mm -hmm. original version. Okay, well, uh, we got to wrap this. We've already gone an hour and a half now, and I know Oops. you guys have meetings to get to. Uh, mm. I don't want to abuse my my welcome here at the Ann Arbor District Library. <laughs> as awesome as you guys are, uh, I can't I can't be here forever. So, uh, I want to say thanks to Cole. Man, let's do this again, please. Let's do sure. it again and again. Okay. I love it. <laughs> Let's get you on with Brandon, and we'll have that talk about uh, the role of manliness. I really want to oh, unbox yeah. that discussion. I think it'd be a great one. Um, but Cole, what, what's the one thing you want people to check out today that you did? Um, I'd say, like again, my Twitter is probably the best place. Um, uh, you can look at if you search Orc Wars. Orc Wars is now on YouTube, not legally, but you can watch it there. You can torrent it from all sorts of you countries. You can torrent it? Yeah, uh, illegal. But I was talking with yeah. Rachel Polk about this this morning. Uh, you watch Dork Wars, right? And what, 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 is it, is it uh, doing the Siskel and Ebert? Not that you know who those people are. Is it thumbs up or thumbs down? She gives it the thumbs up. So there, it's got the okay. Ra the Rachel Polk seal of approval at least. So Rachel, I hope I hope that was I hope that was <laughs> what? You know, it's, fun, it's funny because we're just getting. It's it's very uh, apparently it's very polarizing. Like some people really like it, and then there's people who you get you get those people anytime you do anything publicly. That's true. You get those people. But um, yeah, yeah, uh, that or you know you can check out my Vimeo uh, it has all my short films, which has Durostwin and the Promethean on it. Very cool. All right, so we will link to that in the show notes as well, and all these things are available at EventideCreative.com as well, right? I, yeah, most of them. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks again, Cole. Thanks to the Ann Arbor District Library for letting me do this show every two weeks. Uh, we stream live on Wednesdays at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Rachel Moyer, is there anything else that I missed? I don't believe so. Okay. Well, then, then we'll get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and, and if anybody wants to go online today, I just want to do a shout-out for a friend of mine, uh, Mark Mariano, who does a comic called Happy Lou, which I've recommended on the show. He's got a new book out today on Amazon called The Other Side of Hugless Hill. Um, and it's about uh, a town of monsters. And this is a story, a story for kids. So if you have kids or if you work with kids or if you're like me and just a big kid, I think this is a great book. And it's about these two monsters who live in this town of mean monsters and they're not mean. And how do they deal with that? How do they solve this situation? And I think we can all relate to being surrounded by people who aren't quite as sweet and nice as us or as, uh, as straightened out as us and solving that problem. So uh, he's, a, he's a talented artist who deserves more recognition. I love, love, love his comics. So people should go to uh, Amazon today. What he's trying to do is make a Hugless Hill Day, where if you order um, the other side of Hugless Hill today, we're trying to make it a, a bestseller on Amazon. So I ordered mine. I encourage everybody watching to order theirs. Thanks to Matt Dubay and Eric Kloster in the control room for keeping things all knitted together while we do the show. Thanks again to Dean Tripp of DeanTripp.com, Cole Glass of EventideCreative.com, and Rachel Polk of RachelPolk.com for this great show. Uh, it will be archived at ComicsAreGreat.com slash CAG97. And until next time, I've been Jersey Drozd of ComicsAreGreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye.